Hello, and welcome to Causal Foundations. My name is Naftali Weinberger, and I'm a researcher at the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy. In these videos, I'll be introducing key concepts from causal inference in videos of approximately 10 minutes. Now, I'm not going to presuppose any prior knowledge, but if you've heard anything about causation, you've probably learned that correlation does not imply causation. In today's video, I'm going to consider what does this actually mean, and is it true? And I'm going to argue that under certain understandings of correlation, correlation does, in fact, imply causation. Now let me begin with something that's clearly true, which is that causation is not just correlation plus time ordering. Consider a barometer, and suppose that the reading on the barometer goes down before a storm occurs. So here we have a correlation, and also one thing happening before another, but clearly it's not the case that the barometer reading causes the storm. So we see that a correlation in time is not sufficient for causation. That being said, there is a causal explanation of the correlation. Both the barometer and the storm depend on atmospheric pressure. So there's a common cause that explains the correlation. This suggests the following principle, known as the principle of the common cause, due to Hans Reichenbach. It says that if two variables x and y are correlated, then either x causes y, y causes x, or x and y share a common cause c, such that x and y are uncorrelated conditional on c. So if there's a correlation between being happy and owning an iPad, either buying an iPad makes you happy, happier people are led to buy iPads, or there's some other explanation. Perhaps wealthier people are both happier and more likely to buy an iPad. Although this principle goes back to the 1950s, it's still foundational for causal inference. This is because it's entailed by something known as the causal Markov condition, which I'll be describing in a future video. Like everything in philosophy, it's not uncontroversial, and here I'm not going to give a full defense of it, but what I will do is describe a certain case of examples which are often taken as counterexamples to the principle, but which in fact are not. Now you might have come across pictures such as the following. This one purports to show a correlation between per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Cases like this are often offered as illustrations of why correlation does not imply causation. And in this case, I'm inclined to believe that there is no causal explanation of this phenomena. Perhaps you disagree. Perhaps you can think of a story of why cheese eaters are more subject to becoming tangled in their bedsheets. But even if you can, it really doesn't matter because it turns out that there's thousands of cases like this. And you can find many of them at tylerweigen.com. So if this were a counterexample to the principle of the common cause, there would be thousands of them. But I'm going to argue that it is not a counterexample, because these phenomena are not, in fact, correlated. So I'm going to have to say quite a bit about the measure of correlation being used here. And one important fact is that the type of data here involves time series, which is just sets of data points arranged in time. So what do I mean by correlation? Here I'm going to interpret correlation as probabilistic dependence, and this is something that can be precisely defined. Two variables, a and b, are probabilistically independent if the probability of a and b is equal to the probability of a times the probability of b. So two coin flips are independent if it's the case that the probability of both landing heads is equal to the product of the independent probabilities of each landing heads. And they're going to be dependent just in case they're not independent. Now what really matters what follows is that these probabilities are not observed but inferred from the data. So you don't observe that a coin has probability 0.5 of landing heads. You need to learn that from repeated coin flips. So when doing causal inference from data, there are in fact two steps. First, we need to infer probabilities from the data, and that's standard statistical inference. And then we need to infer the causal models from facts about probabilistic dependence, 
and that's causal inference. The most common measure of correlation is the Pearson correlation coefficient, denoted by r. Using this measure, a correlation between x and y is given by the following expression, where e refers to the expectation operator, which takes the average, mu x and mu y are the mean values of x and y, and the terms in parentheses are all deviations of observed values of these variables from their means. Continuing with our coin flip example, we can let x and y be coin flips, where the value of 1 corresponds to a coin landing heads and 0 to its landing tails, and because all the coins are fair, we're going to assume that the mean is 0.5. When a coin lands heads, subtracting the mean from it will yield 0.5, when it's tails, we'll get negative 0.5. In the denominator, all of the terms are squared, so it doesn't matter whether it's 0.5 or negative 0.5, and we straightforwardly get a denominator of 0.25. Now let's think about the numerator. Suppose that both x and y match. Well then, they're either both heads for 0.5 times 0.5, or both tails for negative 0.5 times negative 0.5. Either way, we get 0.25. So if the coins always matched, the numerator would be 0.25. Divide by 0.25, we get 1 for a correlation of 1, or perfect correlation. If x and y don't match, then it would either be 0.5 times negative 0.5, or vice versa, yielding negative 0.25. So if the coins never matched, it would be the case that we'd have a correlation of negative 1. And of course, we can get any mixture of matching and not matching. And if they match and don't match an equal amount of the time, we would end up with a correlation of 0. Now, you might have noticed that so far I've said almost nothing about data or sampling. All of the numbers in the prior example came from the a priori assumption that the coins were fair and thus had a 50% chance of landing heads. If we were dealing with actual data, things would be a lot messier. So if you flipped a coin 10 times, it's actually fairly unlikely that it would come up heads exactly five of those times. So what is it we're talking about when we describe the correlation coefficient as a good measure of probabilistic dependence? What we're assuming is that given what we know about coin flips, we believe that as we observe more coin flips, the average in the sample will approach the average in the population from which we're sampling. More generally, we believe that R is a good measure of probabilistic dependence for this process, since we believe that in the long run, positive values of R will correspond to genuine probabilistic dependence, while a lack of correlation, or R equals zero, will correspond to a lack of probabilistic dependence. So now we can turn to the question of whether R is a good measure of correlation for cases such as this. And here I'm going to be charitable and assume that the matching of these two trends is not just due to the fact that we have so few data points, and that if we were going to continue collecting data, both of these would continue trending upward in a manner analogous to things like GDP. Even so, R would not be the correct measure of correlation for these time series. And to see why, think about where the mean is for both of them, which is around this line. And one thing you should ask yourself is whether you should expect that as we collect more data, it will converge towards the mean. And hopefully it's clear that it won't. As you collect more data, the mean will go up over time. So unlike with the coin flip, where we have reason to believe that as we collect more data, we'll tend towards the mean, here we believe that will not happen. And a consequence of this is that almost all points earlier than the mean will be below it, and almost all points later will be above it. And this is sufficient for there to be a high correlation between these two time series. Now the lesson I draw from this is not that these are in fact correlated, but that R is just the wrong measure of correlation for cases such as this. Because it doesn't tell us anything about whether one time series tells you about the other, but only reflects the time ordering of the data. And as a matter of fact, people who use time series in their research would not use the R coefficient for cases such as this. So, does correlation imply causation? If by correlation we mean genuine probabilistic dependence, 
The answer is yes. And many of the examples supposedly showing correlation without causation are in fact cases where there's no such dependence. But my reason for being worried about the refrain that correlation does not imply causation isn't just that it's false, but rather that it's so typically used as a warning rather than an invite. It's used as a way to tell people working with data how to avoid drawing causal conclusions rather than telling them how to draw proper causal conclusions. So what I want to tell you is we're always drawing causal conclusions. And it's really important to get clear on how to do that responsibly. And that's going to be my aim in the videos that are a part of this series. Thank you for listening. For further information about today's topic, check out the following paper by Kevin Hoover.